Order up your fruit.
Okay, well, good evening. Um, I'll give you a lead dance picture for just a minute longer. I want to give you a quick update on the, uh, on the recovery status. Uh, the last month or so since we met last time. Let's start with the uh, uh, the bolting operations that we've been conducting in the underground. And, uh, this is the, as I talked about this a little bit last time, this is our new uh, hybrid boulder that we've uh, we purchased. It's uh, both diesel and electric. Um, the unit is currently, as you can see, is disassembled. It's in two major, major components on the surface right now. But we're making preparations to take it underground uh, within the next uh, three or four days. And then uh, we'll start reassembling it underground uh, and put it into service. And the significance of this, as we've talked about, is we're extremely limited in the underground due to the ventilation capacity. So having Electric piece of equipment doesn't produce the diesel particulate, uh, enables us to increase the number of pieces of equipment that we have operating underground at the same time. So, this will effectively double our bulk capacity without impacting the ventilation. It looks like we're having got some slight battery problems with the mic, so if you could maybe just go a little louder than normal. Sure. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on. So, so where are we with the with ground control? Uh, so this this has been updated slightly from been updated slightly from our last meeting. Uh, I want to just point out uh, where we were last month. Uh, we were about right here in East 140 drift. So we've been moving down. We completed the East 140 drift. Uh, we've done this leg here in 3310. We've also, this, this map isn't quite current, we've, uh, we've moved up to 38, drift. So we're, this, this leg right here has been completed and we're about right here. So we'll continue moving down, is that better on the? We'll continue moving down the East 300 drift uh, uh, to the north and then, uh, I'm sorry, to the south. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll start moving down some of the side drifts. So, teams making uh, teams making great progress. Uh, they continue to work. That's in a contamination area, so they're continuing to work uh, in that area in PPE. Uh, but they're doing that safely and they're doing it uh, without getting contaminated. So, doing a great job. Got it. Right. Okay. Talked a little bit about this last time as well, but, uh, but I want to give you a, another update. Uh, we've talked about radiological risk reduction in the underground, and we talked about uh, using spray um, sprayers. We've got a, a gator vehicle that we've brought in, uh, and we've got uh, a heap of act that we've brought in. The team has been doing a, quite a bit of, of water spray not only in the in the drifts, but they've also been doing a considerable amount in panel seven. Uh, they've been spray painting a number of the, uh, the ductwork in the underground to fix contamination. But in panel 7 specifically, and I'll show you a map here in just a moment, uh, they've, been, they've, they've done three complete washes of the, the back, the ribs, and the floor. And they've seen a, a considerable reduction in the, in the amount of transferable contamination on the order of an order of magnitude, in some cases up to two orders of magnitude. Um, so, so from the facility perspective, uh, what that means is we've been able to reduce the rooms one through five. Remember that room seven is, is isolated now by bulkheads. So that leaves us six rooms. Rooms one through five uh, were previously identified as high contamination areas, which is greater than 2,000 D per M alpha. Uh, they've reduced that uh, to less than 2,000. So those areas are moving back to contamination areas. Uh, room 6 is still a high contamination area. They, they need to do some more washing in that area. And then uh, they've gone back now, and now they're doing the surveys on all the equipment that's sitting in those rooms. So remember, as we moved equipment out of room 7 so that we could close it, we moved that, that equipment into the other rooms. Uh, so we've got shield plugs, we've got forklifts, we've got uh, electric skids, connexes, those kinds of things have been moved. 
And we've got to finish the surveys on those. And once we've done that, then we'll be able to downpost uh, those rooms from a high contamination area to a, to a contamination area. Uh, and so far, the surveys that we've done on all that equipment has come back less than 2,000. And so the team's continuing to do a good job, both in decon, but also in the, in the surveying efforts. But more, the, the other effort that we're doing is we want to replace the floor leading up to panel seven. The, the picture on the right, I don't know if we've shared this in the past, but what the picture on the right shows you is uh, the yellow material is, is what, we've, what we refer to as bratis cloth. That bratis cloth has been anchored on the, on the rib and then runs across the floor and is anchored on the other side. And then salt will get placed on top of the bratis cloth. And, and that's what we talk about when we talk about putting in a new floor. Uh, that's what we're in the process of doing. Now, this isn't in the contamination area. This was a test that we did. But, uh, but this is what we're going to do, and I'm going to show you now where we're going to do that. So this is a map of the, uh, of the current radiological postings. The red areas indicate high contamination areas, meaning that it's got greater than 2,000 deeper M alpha. The, uh, the light blue aqua colored uh, Areas are contamination areas, meaning it's got between 20 and 2,000 deeper M alpha. And then the, the gold colored areas are, are areas that we rolled back as controlled areas. The small green area uh, that you see right there at, uh, at South 1950 is our transition point. So that's how we're moving equipment and personnel from the controlled area to the contamination areas and back. What we're going to do is we're going to lay down a new floor from that transition point down to south uh, 2520, and then we're going to turn towards panel 7 and lay a new floor down to the entrance of panel 7. So we're going to move from here, lay down bratis cloth and salt to this intersection, and then come down to here. And then this will be where the new transition point gets established, and this will be a new floor. Once we've laid that new floor down, effectively what we'll have done um, is we'll have trapped the contamination underneath the bratis cloth, underneath the new salt. Um, the bratis cloth will keep it from transferring up. Uh, and so we'll effectively have created a clean environment. We'll be able to roll those areas back and probably downpost them to radiological buffer areas. Um, and that'll allow our guys to come out of uh, the, the pappers, the, the respirators that they're currently in, and some of the PPE that we're wearing. So, again, it will be a great, a great opportunity for us to move those areas back. Uh, it will help, help the guys in terms of the workload and efficiencies that they've got to perform in the underground. Uh, I mentioned the, the rooms in panel 7, and you can see on this map anyway, all six of the rooms are still posted as HCAs. And as I talked about, the reason the rooms one through five are still posted that way is because we've got to finish surveys on the equipment. And once, those, once the equipment surveys are done, then we'll be able to downpost all those to CAs. Again, that'll be a big difference for the operators coming, uh, working in that environment versus a high contamination area. That means they effectively get to take one layer of the PPE that they have to wear now. They'll be able to take that off. So that'll help them out quite a bit with heat stress and some of the workload that they've got. Okay, um, other changes um, since the last meeting. I talked about the fact that we were establishing a combustible control zone, uh, but we've effectively implemented it now. So what we did, just as a reminder, we were trying to uh, ensure that we've created the safest environment that we can, um, especially in the event that there's another fire. And so what we wanted to look at was, uh, based on, on uh, airflow, where does the air come into the underground, where does it exhaust, and where do, our, where do our workers have to go to get out of the mine? And so basically, as you would, as you would imagine, that then centers around our air intake shaft, our salt shaft, and our waste hoist. Um, and so uh, we drew a, a circle around those areas and many of the drifts that lead to them and what we've done in those areas is we've removed all combustible materials. So anything that was paper, cardboard, rubber, uh, any fuels, anything that was in there that could burn, we've removed it from those areas. 
We've also restricted um, diesel fueled equipment. It can move through the area, but it can't park in the area. So it can't be left unattended. It can't be parked in the area. Um, and so effectively what we've done now is we've created an area where the fire can't uh, follow the workers into this area. Uh, so this effectively keeps, keeps a safe area for them. Uh, they know that as they, as they get to their egress routes or they get to the egress conveyances and they're waiting, uh, they know that the fire can't move into, into this area. Now, in addition to this, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to remove combustibles from the underground. It's something else to control what goes in in the first place. And so uh, we've set up a new combustible control permitting process. Uh, and what that means is uh, on the surface now, our fire protection engineers evaluate everything that's going in the underground. So any equipment, any materials uh, that need to be taken into the underground, they evaluate from a fire protection perspective. Um, and then uh, they have to do the calculations and they have to put a sticker on, the, on that material that's going in the underground. Uh, and so we're going to control how much combustible material, how much flammable material uh, goes into the underground on any given day. Now, in the, in the underground, then, you know, it's, it's easy to, to, uh, to see how if you're just taking a little bit in every day and accumulating it in the underground, you can still get a fairly high uh, concentration or a high inventory of material. So in addition to having that combustible free zone in the underground, controlling what goes in on a daily basis, we've also got procedures in place now that uh, do the inventories in the underground on a routine basis to, to count basically the, the items that are there. And, and if we then exceed our pre-established limits, then, then we simply remove material or we have to take other compensatory measures. Uh, and those other compensatory measures could be things like covering uh, the items with fireproof blankets or spacing them in such a way that fire can't propagate from one combustible item to the next. Now, uh, the significance of both the implementation of, of this combustible control program as well as the closure of panel six and the closure of room seven, panel seven, is that, is that we have now significantly improved the risk posture in the underground to the point where we can safely allow more workers in the underground. We were previously limited to 75. Uh, and effective this week, we've increased the number of folks that we can have in the underground to 98. Now, eventually, we're going to, to increase that to 149. Uh, but the item that we need to, to take care of before we allow that is uh, we've got some doors and some bulkheads that, uh, that we want to do some work on, uh, both from a closure perspective, a door closure perspective, not a regulatory closure, but a door closure perspective. And from the, uh, we want to make sure that they're well sealed uh, for ventilation purposes. When we've, when we've done that, we've got three or four doors that we need to do that maintenance on, then we'll be able to, again, increase the number of workers that we have in the underground. All that is, is predicated by our ability to, to be able to remove folks uh, from the underground in a timely manner uh, under emergency conditions in the event that something else were to occur. So, uh, so we're working aggressively to make that happen, and, and the team's done uh, done a great job in setting up the combustible controls program to allow that. Okay, we've spent, I know, a couple of meetings talking about uh, duct work and interim ventilation specifically. Uh, so I want to give you a, a quick update on where we are with interim ventilation system. First, um, I'm going to start in the middle of the slide uh, on the civil engineering work. Uh, the pictures show um, <clears throat> some of the concrete placements that have been completed. Um, so you can see on the top picture, those are the, the two pads. <coughs> the two pads were the fan and filter units. Make sure you explain the IBS system is the HEPA filter. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I should do that. The, the yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll step back for a moment um, and remind everybody that we've got uh, three ventilation projects. Um, that we're, we're undertaking. The first one is the interim ventilation system, 
and it's designed to increase the filtered air capacity that we have. We're currently operating off of two HEPA banks that provide us about 60,000 cubic feet per minute of filtered air, and that's currently what the underground, what the mine has been running on since the events. The IVS system effectively doubles that. It adds another 54,000 cubic feet per minute of filtered uh, air capacity. The second project is the supplemental ventilation system, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. It's, it's designed to provide a second circuit in the underground, so we'll effectively split the air in the underground so that the contaminated areas continue to be uh, vented and filtered through the filtered system. The rest of the underground, the areas that we've rolled back clean are as controlled areas. Those will run through a supplemental ventilation system and run out through the salt hoist uh, or through the salt shaft as clean. And then the third project uh, is the longer term permanent ventilation project that we've talked about where we would, uh, we're looking at the different alternatives uh, right now, but uh, that could be as something as robust as a new shaft with a new ventilation system on the top of it, or it could be uh, use of the existing shafts with a new ventilation system on the surface. So those are the three projects. So this is the first one. This is the filtered, uh, the additional filtered capacity. Um, and, and the two, uh, on the top right-hand picture, that shows you the two concrete pads where the new fan and filter units will be will sit. Um, the bottom picture just shows you one of the 30 or so concrete pads that we had to had to place to support the new ductwork for this system. Uh, so these are the two fan and filter pads and then this is one of the one of the pads that's been poured to support the ventilation ductwork. Um, so that work, all the, all the concrete pours and placements were completed uh, this week. The, the vendor is now working through the final grading and cleanup, and they're scheduled to demobilize in about a week or so. So that's been a, that's been a positive uh, uh, change at the facility. The ductwork that uh, supports this system, just as a reminder, we, we received seven of the 12 shipments from the manufacturer uh, when they arrived, we did the receipt inspection on the welds and found um, about 40 of the 1,000 welds or so uh, were, uh, were of poor workmanship. So we stopped the shipment of the remaining uh, five shipments of ductwork. We've since sent uh, a number of representatives, both CBFO, NWP, our corporate AECOM uh, office has sent a number of folks to the to the vendor site. Um, they have inspected their, all the remaining ductwork at, at his facility. Uh, they've identified all the welds that uh, had poor workmanship, and they've reworked all those welds and, and completed all of the testing, uh, factory testing, um, and now they're, they're doing a final inspection. And so we expect for those final five shipments to be released in the next two weeks or so. When those shipments are released, all right, there she is. Mary, I was, I was worried about you. I asked about you. Um, the seven shipments that we've already received, uh, that team will come here uh, to Carlsbad, and then they'll work through the same rework program where they'll fix those, those identified welds, uh, they'll retest, reinspect, and then we'll do a formal receipt inspection uh, and acceptance of those at the site. So I expect that to happen as I said, once the, once the remaining ductwork ships, then that team will come with it and start the rework of the ductwork that we've already received. The fan and filter units, again, just to remind everybody, um, those systems were, were completed. They were tested at the manufacturer's site. They were shipped, uh, but they weren't shipped in accordance with the approved shipping plan. And as a result, they, they suffered damage during transport. Uh, those two units are currently sitting down at uh, uh, Nuclear Filter Technology NFT's facility, the old EPD facility here in town, um, and they've been, they EPD have been contracted uh, to do the inspections of the two units. 
they've completed the inspection on one. Uh, they're going to complete the inspection on the second one this week. They've already developed the rework plans for the first unit, and those plans are being uh, reviewed by various organizations uh, to be approved. And then, uh, and then we'll have EPD do the actual repairs um, here in Carlsbad. Uh, once the repairs are done, then a, a team of folks will come in with, with the original manufacturer and they'll repeat the, the factory acceptance testing uh, on the reworked units. Um, and, then, and then once that's acceptable to everyone, then we'll, we'll have those systems shipped back to the site. So right now we're looking at uh, about a month uh, to complete all those activities, give or take a week or so. Uh, but we're looking at, uh, you know, probably sometime in August to have those units back at the site. So, so that's all the systems will come together. The duct work will arrive uh, in late July, early August. The, uh, the fan and filter units will arrive in August. And uh, we, we should have a, a mechanical, uh, a contract awarded to a mechanical vendor who will take all that equipment and plumb it up and, uh, and get it into service. So. So we're making some headway there after, after the first couple of initial um, pickups that we had on, on receipt. The second system that I talked about, this is the system that's going to uh, uh, be our clean air circuit. Um, this system uh, it effectively is a, is a large fan that will be placed in the underground, and then it will uh, um, it'll draw air in and push it out through the existing salt hoist, our salt shaft. So uh, the system was factory tested uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, it was put on the road Wednesday. It arrived at the site on Thursday. Um, we waited until Monday when we had all the folks back at the site, did the receipt inspection. Um, it passed, uh, so it's, it's in good shape. Um, the system, as I mentioned, is going to be placed uh, in the vicinity of the air intake shaft. So it'll be in the south 90 drift uh, in the underground. Uh, you can see it in pieces there on the top picture and then um, its configuration as it was being tested at the manufacturers in the bottom. Uh, when it's installed, it'll draw about 130,000 cubic feet per minute from the surface into the underground. Um, now, currently, the design of this system it was designed assuming that the interim ventilation system was operational. Um, so it, it, it relies on the interim ventilation system uh, to be operating, and it relies on a certain amount of air being drawn through the filtered part of the mine to keep this unit from overpowering uh, the filtered systems and pushing air in the wrong, wrong places or sucking air from the wrong areas. So right now, the design requires interim ventilation to be operational, and, and we just talked about that, where that is. That's still several months away. This system could be available um, several months before the interim ventilation system is available. So uh, we're going to look at that and see if, uh, if there's a way to, to uh, throttle this system back in a way that uh, doesn't overpower the existing ventilation system. Uh, while we wait for the interventilation system to come online. But, but that's still a, an engineering study that we're working on and don't have a final answer at this point. Okay. The, uh, the last slide that I wanted to cover with you today is, is an update on our, on our emergency operations center. So when Secretary Flynn was here um, last month, he talked about SEPs, and he mentioned a number of SEPs, and one of them he talked about was um, a new emergency operations center and some training to emergency responders in the, in the local area. Th this slide talks specifically about that new emergency operations center. So this is uh, being put in place in the Skeen Whitlock building. Um, currently, we've got our emergency operations center uh, at the site. Um, which is not a good place to have it in, during an emergency or in an event because it, it, its location could have it involved in the actual emergency. So we're going to have this new facility built um, at the Skeen Whitlock building. Uh, we've actually uh, created the space 
And where the team is now is they're installing the, the software and the furniture and the, and the, uh, uh, the electronics package that, that you would normally expect to see in a, an emergency operations center. One of the, the key elements from a software perspective is we're going to use what's called Web EOC, which is a commercially available software program. It's what many of the um, emergency operations centers, both at the city, county, state, and federal level, they use that as a common platform uh, so that people can communicate with each other during an event. So we're going to move to that software. We'll have it online. Uh, right now, we're looking at having this emergency operations center uh, outfitted and ready for uh, startup activities by the end of September. So it's coming along quite well, and uh, we're pretty excited about having, having this capability. Related back to the SEPs, one of the things that uh, uh, we're, we're offering then is that once we've outfitted this facility, um, if there are other events that, are, that happen to go on, uh, flooding, tornadoes, some other event here in the local area that would require um, an emergency operations center to be stood up, you know, this facility will be available to, to the city, county, and even the state uh, if necessary uh, to help manage those types of operations. So it'll be a it's a great asset for WIP to have, but it's also a great asset for uh, for the state, for the city of Carlsbad to have. So we're we're really excited about getting this in, and then we'll, as soon as we get it up and running, we'll look to bring folks through and introduce them to it, show them the capabilities and how they could fit in. Okay, so with that, Sean, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there for questions and answers, and then. This emergency system that you had the slide up there about, um, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the <laughs> meeting, but are people going to have access to this? Can we get online and see what's going on and get information ourselves? Or? Yeah, so, so that's a great question, Mary, now, but let me... Let me start by explaining what the Emergency Operations Center is. Okay, it's not, it's not a, uh, a repository of information. It's not designed to be a, uh, a daily um, operational facility. It's designed to be stood up during, pure, during an emergency. So only during an emergency would it, would it be activated. Now, once it's activated, um, then, then it does tie in with fire departments, with the police departments, and so the normal protocols that we would go through as a city or a, a county during an emergency, those communications venues would be available. Now, I don't know that, that most folks, most um, people would be able to tie in directly to the, to the systems because those are fairly secure because they do tie in to all of the emergency response organizations. But it's not just a DOE organization. It would tie in to the state EOC up in Santa Fe, it ties in, like I said, to the local fire departments, to the sheriff's departments. So it, it ties into all those emergency responder organizations. It's not designed with the capacity to allow uh, a number of, of individuals to log on to the system. Um, so the communications would come through the normal communications protocols that the city and the county and state establish. Okay. So, but in terms of coming, you know, once we get it established, if, if anybody from the community wants to come see it, absolutely, we'll be more than happy to show people where it is and what it can do and show you the systems that it has available and how it would operate during an emergency. We'll be more than happy to do that. Okay. Other questions? Bear with me. I think I have a few questions. One is, um, you mentioned the um, True Waste Corporate Board meeting. Uh, there's usually a whole bunch of presentations during those meetings, and sometimes you can catch a few of those on the web if you search long enough. So in order to make that search easier, I request 
I formally request that you share the same information that you share internally with the interested public in posting these on your website. In addition, that you post all presentations related to WIP from Waste Management 9, uh, 15 on the website. I've made this request repeatedly and it seems I'm just making it into a black hole. So I'm making it here formally. Likewise, the presentations that will be made or have been made during the Health Physics Society meeting in Indiana, I believe, later this month. I believe there are some web presentations supposed to be given there as well. So, but beyond that, any presentation given anywhere by WIP representatives in a public forum or in a forum that is not covered by um, national security issues and can therefore not be released, that they be posted on the web so that we have the same information that, for example, the Antis have and that everybody else has. In other words, keep people in Carlsbad as informed as everybody else. That's one request. Um, then um, the last time I asked the question about the study that has been done or is still in progress on what would be the actual exposure to workers if you just said forget about all this additional filtered ventilation, just blow whatever it is there out the shaft and what would be the dose to the people up above on the surface and what would be the dose to the workers because you're very good at killing time during these town hall meetings in telling us what you have done, but you're very poor in explaining why you are doing what you are doing, and you have still not explained to anybody's satisfaction as to why you are doing all this decontamination. You're giving general um, statements such as that you have reduced radiological risk but you're not associating any numbers with that kind of statement. So that statement is actually completely meaningless to anyone who is not on the inside. You um, are saying that you have reduced uh, the risk by one or, or two orders of magnitude, and maybe that's not the risk, but the, yeah, but the DPM. But real numbers would mean something. This stuff doesn't mean very much. You're still using DPM rather than DPS, which exaggerates the danger. You're not saying who requires you to do that. You are not saying who requires, you, you, you say we are limited to 75 workers underground. Who limits you to that? I think that's an internal DOE or even WIP thing. And then you say, but with the um, interim ventilation, you can go up to uh, 94 and then you go to something like 140 with the, with the other ventilation. So I have some other questions later, but you know, let me just start with this. Let, let, let me say one thing about waste management and other presentations that go on at these invited uh, organizational meetings across the country. There's one every week. I mean, you could go to one, uh, you know, maybe every day, but there are a heck of a bunch of them. But all of these groups typically require any presenter to sign off on some guy. Kind of, yes, they do. Sign off on an agreement that they won't distribute and that the, the organization who has received a large amount for registration is the distributor of that information. I'm just telling you, Norbert, no. don't argue with me, I can tell you. Because nobody who is working for the government, directly or indirectly, has any copyright. So then it's well, well, that's, uh, you know, having been a presenter at many of these, there is always a sign-off. And <laughs> well, I don't know whether that... Well, I'm just telling you what the, what the conditions are for presenters. Abe, what is the situation at Waste Management? For Waste Management... Uh, I don't have a microphone, but it's DOE employees do not uh, sign off 
But contractor employees do. No, they don't. I have done it myself when I worked for WIC. They don't either. No. Well, sorry. Norbert, we're not going to argue about it. That's what it is. I'm a better contractor. Well, Norbert, I can talk to what I presented at Waste Management and what I presented this week to the corporate board, which what I presented at Waste Management was very similar to what you receive every week here. It was an update on where we were at in recovery. And, in fact, what I presented to the corporate board this week was an update of that presentation, which we can make public. There is absolutely no reason we can't put that presentation on. As for the generator sites, some of them did have their material mark draft uh, deliberative process, and so that would not be available for the public um, in terms of what they were doing with their true waste processing. Um, does that answer your question for the presentations? I know that we... I know I can make mine available. I don't know. I can't speak for everyone. But uh, as for, I think I wrote down several other. I tried to capture them all, but I, I'm going to let Jim jump onto some of them. So let me let me start with the uh, with the 75. So Norbert, you, you questioned the, the number of folks we could have in the underground. So remember that um, after the events, the waste hoist. Uh, conveyance was inoperable for six months or so. So we had the salt hoist and we had the air intake. And, and as you know, those are the air intake is extremely limited in terms of the number of people that can bring up in a single uh, evolution. A salt is a little bit better. So MSHA requires us to have two separate egress routes, um, and it requires us to evacuate the people in the underground within a certain period of time. And, and that's, that includes not only their, their route that they have to take to get to the conveyance, but then the, the cycle time of the conveyance it's, it itself. And so we, we did the calculations. It was pretty straightforward. And we limited ourselves initially to 24 people in the underground. When, when we brought the waste hoist back on, it has a, a much higher capacity for, for, uh, to bring people out. But because of the the configuration in the underground related to the safety systems. And we had combustibles in a number of different areas, the egress routes themselves. The AIB mentioned that they were obstructed in many cases. The, the uh, reflectors weren't, weren't adequately spaced. The strobes didn't, didn't adequately illuminate the areas they needed to illuminate. So there were a number of safety things that we had to go fix. And so we limited, we, NWP, limited the number of people in the underground to 75 based on having those three conveyances available. Now, what we've done is we fixed a number of those safety systems, run the calculations again, assuming the waste hoist is running and the salt is running, um, and, and we've, we've applied a safety factor of four. Right, so you can do the, the simple calculations on how many folks can get out in a certain period of time. We applied a, a uh, it's not, I don't want to call it an industry standard because it's not written in a, in a requirements document, but the coal industry, as an example, uses a safety factor of four. So we just used a safety factor of four, divided the number, and it comes out to 98. Now, when we, when we do some of the other things that I talked about, like fixing some of the doors, again, we feel like that we can reduce that safety factor from four to three, and that will allow us to go to 149. Now, now we could argue you know, any number of people will have different opinions on what's the right safety factor to apply. Um, but, but in our technical opinion, we're going to limit it to 149, but, but today it's 98. And that's based on, based on a safety factor of four. So, so if you go back to DOE, you won't find that number. If you go back to MSHA, you're not going to find that number. You're right. It's an NWP-imposed restriction. But, but we feel it's, there's reasons for it. We also feel like we can defend the number in terms of it being OK to have that many. Um, and now the question just becomes, could it be higher? Sure, it could. But it's the safety factor we've applied. Now, you asked a number of questions on the, on the contamination uh, and the cleanup levels. And, and so I'm going to, uh, I think I've said this before, but, but I'll try to be, um, I'll restate it. We, we could operate 
in the underground today with the current contamination levels. There are many sites in the complex that have this level of contamination or higher and, and they suit their people out, they train their people, they equip them and they go in and they perform work in contaminated areas just like we are. But there is a, a management um, practice that tries to reduce that risk of folks getting contaminated. Not, it's not so much the environment they're working in, it's, it's the fact that it doesn't take much alpha contamination if, if it were to get inside somebody uh, to cause, cause very high dose rates, regardless of how small it is on the outside. And we are dealing with alpha contamination. So we have, we have said we're going to do uh, a number of things to try to reduce that risk. We're not going to get it to zero. We're not going to get it clean. But we are going to do what, what we think is appropriate in terms of deconning down as low as we can get it uh, within reason. Now, in terms of the numbers, I think one of the presentations, we, we showed a slide that said that we had anywhere from uh, about 60,000 DPRM. And, and you asked why we use DPRM instead of DPS. Well, our equipment reads in DPM. That's why we use DPM. It's, it's not. It, there's no other reason that simply the equipment that we're using reads in DPM. And that's the way all of the, the DOE requirements documents are set up. The limits that are established are based on disintegrations per minute. So we could do the conversion, but then we'd be putting out numbers that, that don't match up with what DOE uh, limits and standards and requirements are based on. I mean, you, you just have to do the math to convert it back. So there's no, there's no um, subterfuge there at all. It's simply that's the way DOE reports it, and that's the way the equipment reads it. So that's the way we report it. Now, we've had anywhere from, I think, as high as 60,000 DPRIM alpha. And again, if you want to put that in disintegrations per second, it's, it's uh, 360,000 disintegrations per second. But it's, it's 60,000 DPRIM is how we report it at the high end, and on the low end, it's, it's only, you know, it's, it's a slightly above 20 DPRM. And, and it's, you know, showing a single map that had, you know, every, <laughs> every data point that we take, which is about every three feet, and we have eight miles of underground, putting up a single map that had a number for every three feet, you, you can imagine how complicated that slide set would get. But, it rain, but we know the ranges in the areas where we're, in the different areas where we're working. In panel seven, we had upwards of, in, in room seven, we had over 100,000. But in rooms six, five, four, uh, we had 40 to 50,000 deep rim in some areas. And those were all knocked down below 2,000. In many cases, those got down to about four or 500. Um, and in some cases, even less than 100. So, so that's why it's, it's, it's a little hard for me, Norbert, to give you a, sim a simple answer because, as you know, it, it just depends on what the reading was at that location prior to us doing the decon activity. So we, keep, so we talk more in generalities only because I couldn't possibly give you the, the 10,000 data points and then what their subsequent change was, um, not, not in a setting like this. Um, now, there's, that data is available. Um, and we're working on getting it into a, a format that people can understand. Uh, but, but a lot of that data is available, and, we're, and we are sharing it uh, as we get it. Now, I think, what else did you ask? You asked, did we hit the, the major key points? And you, uh, you multiplied the 60,000. You should have divided it down to 1,000 back or else. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what it's DPS versus DPM. <laughs> okay, here's a couple of. Okay. I've got, I've got a large stream. I'll do the best I can, and then we'll give Norbert another turn here. Um, I had a lot of interest in the cloth floor. Uh, there was a, one question, um, just for some more background, describing the floor purposes and specs and whether that information is posted online. And then there was another question um, in terms of shielding from the new floor.
quite a bit of the alpha radiation is americium. What is the dose rate for someone standing in those hot areas by the transition point? So you guys can extrapolate on the, the cloth floor a little bit. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to apologize up front because I'm going to have to talk in some generality. But So here's, here's a picture again of the, of the floor. So it's, the Bratis cloth is actually a, a plastic um, material that's uh, reinforced. Um, and then we're going to put uh, anywhere from three to six inches of salt. We're getting absolutely no dose from americium um, in any part of the underground outside of room seven, panel seven. So, so there won't be any dose. There's no dose now, and there won't be any dose after we put down the floor from americium or for any other isotope for that matter. Um, this is purely a contamination control measure, meaning we're trying to control the alpha materials um, that represent a contamination hazard, not a radiation hazard. Okay. What was the other part of that question? Uh, whether the specs of the, the floor are posted online. The specs of the Bratis cloth? Um, no, hadn't planned on that. It's a, it's a commercially available you, you can go on to Google or go to the manufacturer and they'll probably give it to you, but we hadn't planned to post the Bratis cloth specs. I don't, I don't think. Okay. All right. You want me to do a couple more, Norbert, before I give it back? Okay. Uh, it, why did you move the EOC and is there a document explaining that online? I'm, I'm searching my memory trying to remember what all we put online. But the short answer to the first part of that question is, why do we move it? Well, if, if you have an event, if we have another event, whether it's a fire on the surface or uh, some type of chemical spill from, from a passing uh, truck that creates some kind of a hazardous cloud over the area, the last place that you want to have your emergency operations center is in the middle of the hazard. Because not only do our people have to travel to get to it, which exposes them, but now they're in the middle of the hazard. They're no longer emergency responders. They are, in fact, the casualties associated with the event. So what most people, I think everybody, moves their emergency operations center outside of the hazard area so that it can provide command and control during the event. That's as simple as the answer gets. We, we were on site. That was our only capability. We are moving that off site so that we have an isolated command and control function that can operate during, during the hazard and provide support. It also, because it's off site, as I mentioned, it, it will allow folks that have to respond to it to be able to travel to it safely without having to go through the hazardous area. Now, I don't know if we have a document that really describes that. I, I would probably uh, point to the, the NIMS, the National Incident Management System Framework, which is a federal document. It, it probably lays out requirements for an EOC. Let me do one more. This is part question, part chastisement, I think. Um, this question has been asked numerous times. Data for each survey performed by the RCTs. The RCC, RCT documents each of the surveys in accordance with DOE requirements. Where is this data? So, Tim, I'll have to ask you to help me out. I don't, I'm not sure how much of that we've posted or where we are and all that. but we We've posted some uh, summary data from different areas that would be surveyed. And as Jim alluded to earlier, to post that much or to try to document that in a way that made sense to everybody would be really, really difficult to do. We're looking at uh, different ways that we can uh, uh, try to produce maps with that data that makes it uh, uh, digestible to everybody. Uh, you know, um, for example, you can display that sort of data different ways. You can explain it, uh, display it topographically. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty labor-intensive exercise to take that level of data, the number of data points, and try to uh, get them into a, 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 a visual document that makes a lot of sense and can be easily interpreted by, by everybody. 
So how far are your data points away from each other? I mean, are they 10 feet? Are they 20 feet? Are they? Three feet. Three feet. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the, 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 so it varies. If, Surveys if you, are not necessarily if, if just. If you did something broader than that, that was more easily interpreted, maybe every 30 feet or some sort of thing, uh, and and put the numbers down and how they where they were and where they are now, I think we keep getting this question. <laughs> And I'm just trying to suggest something to get to some kind of an answer where somebody can look at the mine, they can look at the ribs, or look at the look at the back, or look at the floor, and understand what the you know what the rate is at those particular points without having to cover right. ten. 20,000 different data points. Maybe there's some way to consolidate it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll definitely look at that again and see if there's a, a better way to, to do that. The other thing that I want to remind everybody, and, and maybe this is what, what is adding to the, to the desire, is that that's constantly changing. So even if we go in and, and give you the survey data uh, today, a month from now, that, that data will be, will be different, you know, based on either, either natural um, uh, based on our decon efforts, or based on just the transferable contamination, or any other number of factors, but, but we'll try to figure out a way, John, to to pictorially portray without without as Norbert's alluded to, without just talking in generalities, but try to give something to give some people an idea. Uh, isotherms, we talked, we thought thought isotherms might be a way to do it, but it's too variable in terms of where the you can't draw the lines very well based on the, the level of contamination in different areas, but we'll, we'll figure out something. Um, I have this map that I printed off direct frisk that has a lot of contamination yeah. numbers on it. Now, if you would just, as Mr. Heaton was kind of discussing, if you just take these particular points that you already have in the beginning and then give us readings of those, you know, you just give us the new readings. That way we have a way of seeing, you know, how the contamination is going in there. Yeah, if, you, if you'll remember, about, uh, about four town hall meetings ago, we, we gave a much more detailed map than that that had probably 100 or so data points on it. Um, and maybe that was part of it, but yeah. So, so if that... We, we can again. We, we can look at that, Mary. If, we, if you think that would would satisfy uh, the group, uh, we'll definitely look at that. I mean, Somebody's keying those numbers in somewhere. It seems to me we, they could be translated. Into yeah, something. we we created that. So though. you don't have to do yeah. all this input. You don't want to say it's translated into some well, more we, general approach that is understandable. We we created that map from from the actual radiological surveys, because there's a lot more data in those surveys. But we, we took the data points and tried to give some idea. But we'll, we'll at least look at maybe updating that, Mary, and show you where the differences are from the last time we presented it. No, they were taking readings. They took readings from, uh, th those may be all from the floor, depending on where, where they were taken, because outside of the exhaust drift, which is the East 300 drift. Outside of that, all the readings, and outside of Panel 7, the readings have all been uh, non-detect on the ribs in the back, meaning the only place we're reading anything is on the floor. Now, when you get into the exhaust drift and you get into Panel 7, there's also readings that we're getting off the back and the ribs. The floor readings have changed when you get the grass block and the salt bath. As you move on it, as we lay down a new floor, it will change. But we'll, that's a good recommendation, Mary. We'll, we'll see what we can do with that. But we keep getting questions. No, and we're, we're struggling with trying to figure out how to answer it, <laughs> too. So that's good. I appreciate the help. Well, I was planning to do this question last, but I'll do it first since we just talked about this item. What's important is that we have a map that shows what would be the dose to the people down there without PPE. And I don't really care how you do that, but Again, the national labs have all kinds of modeling capability, and there are reconstruction efforts that have been done in the past even on modeling the dose from the Trinity experiment. If 
the national labs or somebody else can model that kind of stuff from you know over 50 years ago and give at least some reasonable estimates and whip with the capacity with the horsepower of the two national labs at their disposal should be able to put something like that out again it's a dose don't give a map with dpm or dps because that could be fixed, that could be removable. So make an assessment of what would be the actual dose to the best of your knowledge. Yes, there are some uncertainties attached to that, but the dose is what matters because you introduced risk earlier and you talk about risk reduction. The risk does not come from DPM, it doesn't come from DPS or Becquerel, the risk comes from dose and that's expressed in sievert or millisievert or rem or millirem. That's what matters. Right, Nothing so, else does. So before you go to your next question, let's address that because because you're confusing everybody with those comments because your comments are incorrect. When we talk about dose, most people are talking about radiation from gamma or neutron emitting isotopes. And that is a directly measurable item. And I can tell you exactly when I measure that dose. I can tell you what the impact then is on, on an individual that receives that much dose. We're not talking about radiation here, because I've already told you, the radiation readings are essentially zero in the underground. We're talking about contamination. Contamination is a much more complicated calculation. You cannot take a disintegration per minute from an alpha emitting isotope and say, well, if that gets in the body, of Sean, that's going to cause a certain amount of internal dose. If it gets in the body of Jim, it causes a different amount of internal dose. And so we put our people in protective equipment so they don't get that internal contamination. With, with the dose numbers being different, the DPM numbers being different in every area, it, I can't give exact numbers on a map. What we do, we have to go back then to the generalities. I, I have to assume that if someone is in an area where there is 60,000 deep per M, I then make this, but it's not an assumption, we know what the isotopic distribution is. We would make some assumptions on the breathing rates of that individual. We would make some assumptions on the fact that it's all unprotected, and then we would deposit that amount of material inside the lungs of an individual and the model you're talking about calculates over 50 years how that how those isotopes then move to the bones and what kind of internal dose that causes that is an extremely complicated calculation which is why most people do it in a general general perspective it, it's easy to do external dose calculations it's much harder to do internal dose calculations and put it on a map. Nobody said it would be easy, but it requires some engineering judgment, and that engineering judgment and scientific judgment and putting some higher and lower bounds on it has been done before, and it should be able to be done at WIP. And by the way, the number of data per map unit or whatever, and that that's going to be a complicated map, well, make the map larger. And by the way, to deal with that uh, amount of information, to get that onto a map, there are mapping programs that are out there, the software is out there, you just throw all these data in there. Of course, you have to apply some judgment uh, to it as to what numbers you pick, whether you pick the one from the roof or from the ribs and that sort of thing. But you can actually do that. And then just to go on to what Mary was saying earlier, you know, you could give a map that shows what was the contamination or the dose distribution underground when we started and then you could give one as you proceed and clean it up and then that gives us an idea as to what are you actually accomplishing there and of course that's tied to risk right. again. So, so how about this I mean because I can't do it for every single point in the mine. How about this I've told you the range is anywhere from 20 D per M to 60,000 D per M. How about I tell you what the dose uh, the average dose consequence would be for every 10,000, right? And those numbers are going to be extraordinarily large, but that's okay. I'll give you the numbers. If someone receives 60,000, 60, we can calculate that for you. We'll do 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 
um, and that'll give you a range, and then you can pick the number you like um, in terms of what you think is acceptable. But uh, we can we can probably do it from that perspective. I can't give you every single number. Okay, we're at a point. Uh, you want to make any closing comments? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming to the town hall, both uh, who are physically present in the, t in the room and who are able to join online. I uh, appreciate your questions. Um, we'll be meeting again in about a month, and we'll give you another update. Uh, hopefully everybody will be able to come and come bring your questions. Thank you. Again, thank, thank both of you for being here. Thank you for the questions. And again, those of you online, uh, we wish... Uh, Joe Franco, a lot of luck in his new, uh, new venue, new work, and getting back to where his family is. And uh, we look well forward to working with Phil and, uh, and others that have, have joined us. And uh, so thank you very much again. We appreciate you being here. Diane, thank you again.